I'd like to welcome Brad Bennett back to the podcast. You probably remember that he read to us from his book, A Turn in the River, in Series 3, Episode 23. Well, I asked him back today to do a workshop for us on euphony or sound. I don't know about you, but when I first started out writing haiku and submitting them to, to journals, I was told quite a few times that my haiku were lacking in musicality. And I really didn't know, and I didn't have anyone to ask what that meant. Well, I saw a version of Brad's talk on euphony at the virtual CBEC. Uh, conference. And I wished I'd heard it all those years ago because it would have helped me enormously at the time. And I know some of you feel that we can we can always learn new things. And I did learn new things from listening to Brad's presentation. And so I asked him back because he can help us whether we're really very inexperienced or experienced with the musicality in our work. Brad, I'm really grateful that you came and did this for us today. Now I'm going to just shut up and let you do your thing. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, Patricia, for inviting me to present some of my ideas about sounds of words in haiku. Uh, I really appreciate it. And your podcast is a wonderful uh, treasure. So thank you for including me. So I want to start off my presentation by asserting that in haiku, the moment reigns supreme. I believe that the moment and its sensory experiences should be the main endeavor of a haiku. But the haiku is, of course, a poem. Poems are designed to be read aloud. So as haiku poets, we need to think about how our poems sound in addition to whether we've captured that haiku moment. When we listen to a poem, we are attracted to its pleasing sounds and how they create unity in the poem. Sometimes the sounds of words can also add to the meaning or emotional resonance of a haiku. As Peggy Willis Lyles writes in the preface of her wonderful collection, To Hear the Rain, sound enhances meaning. Every nuance contributes to the total effect. Pamela Miller Ness wrote an excellent essay in Modern Haiku, issue 37-2, called the poet's, the poet's Toolbox, Prosody in Haiku. And that taught me a lot about prosody or euphony in haiku. She writes not only about sound enhancing a haiku's meaning, but that it can also impact its resonance. When used with precision and subtlety, the elements of prosody, such as meter, rhyme, alliteration, assonance, onomatopoeia, enjambment, and repetition can add to the musical enjoyment of the haiku while simultaneously extending the meaning and expanding the emotional resonance. So here's an outline of what I'm gonna be talking about today. I'll start off with a, a little introduction and then some examples from one of the masters, Peggy Willis Lyles. Then I'll get into some of the more traditional devices like rhyme, alliteration, consonants, assonance, and onomatopoeia. And at the end, I have some other considerations that I've uh, kind of put together based on 12 years of studying haiku. And I'm calling these letting the phrase conduct, moonlighting, choosing the right verb, leaping for meaning, and listening to shapes. So first of all, what is euphony? The definition of euphony that I like, believe it or not, is from the Google Dictionary. I like it because of its second part. The quality of being pleasing to the ear, especially through a harmonious combination of words. The tendency to make a phonetic change for ease of pronunciation. And I like the second half of this definition because it implies an active effort on our part to create that sound harmony. Now, my guess is that you've all been creating euphony in your haiku already, at the very least on an unconscious or instinctual level, but often probably more deliberately. You know those moments when you read a haiku and immediately feel that it sounds right, 
but you can't quite put your finger on why until you study that poem a little bit. I think we sometimes respond positively to haiku on an unconscious level because its words are eliciting that euphony, that music. The poem sounds good and feels unified. It goes down easy, like a fine glass of wine or a cup of, ca of chai. The success of a haiku usually lies in that moment keenly observed and expertly recorded, but often the poet used sound words that enhance the meaning and emotional resonance. Here's an example of how this happens instinctually. I was workshopping with my friend Kristen Lindquist when she presented this haiku. Last light, black ducks forage for acorns. Right away, I told her that the poem felt right. She said the poem sounded wet right when she wrote it, but she also said she didn't consciously set about to kind of deliberately choose poetic sound devices. So why did it feel right? right? Why did it sound right? When we looked at it closely, we found alliteration with last and light in the first line, consonants, that CK sound at the end of black and ducks, and assonance, the OR in forage, four, and acorns, that all contributed to unify the poem and create that music, that euphony. I think it was Kristen's poetic skill and experience that led her to choose these words on an instinctive basis. Historically, we haikuists have avoided phonemic de poetic devices like alliteration and rhyme for some very good reasons. Using them in an overt way can feel heavy handed, too clever, too contrived, too cute, or too poetic. Sometimes the use of these devices feels like the poem becomes about the poet rather than the moment. Lee Gerga in Haiku, A Poet's Guide writes, the judicious use of aural devices in haiku can help focus the reader listener's attention on the important aspects of the verse. Overdoing, of course, can spoil a haiku. The brief, fragile haiku is easily overwhelmed by the use of powerful sounds and sound associations. The approach of the haiku poet to this problem, as to everything, requires lightness and balance. So if we can act with lightness and balance, as Lee suggests, why not use some of these poetic devices? We're going to take a look at some of these devices that we can use to produce euphony and haiku. And for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to examine the more phonemic devices, the ones that utilize the individual sounds and words rather than meter, rhythm, and enjambment. When I'm studying some aspect of haiku, I look to the experts. One of the reasons I became interested in euphony was by reading the haiku of Peggy Willis Lyles, whom I think is an expert at euphony. As Alan Burns writes in his introductory notes on Lyles in his anthology, Where the River Goes, few haiku poets have attended so skillfully to sound as Lyles did in her finely crafted poetry. So here are two from her book, To Hear the Rain. Sun shower, the river otter somersaults. Here we have an alliteration of S sounds on the first and third lines. We also hear R controlled endings to three of the words, shower, otter, and part of summer salt. All of the S's and R's in this poem remind me of an otter undulating across a river. Summer night, we turn out all the lights to hear the rain. Night and lights are near rhymes. Making one of those words plural tweaks the poem a bit so that the end rhyme doesn't sound sing-songy. These near rhymes in the first two lines help to tie them together so that that third line really stands out. Now that we've had a bit of a musical prelude conducted by a maestro, let's look at some of the specific phonetic devices 
that we can all use from time to time. First, let's look at rhyme. So rhyme obviously is a repetition of syllables that sound alike. End rhyme are rhymes that end lines. And internal rhyme are rhyming words within lines or within a poem, like we just saw. Also near rhyme, words that almost rhyme. So in English, rhymes really stick out, especially end rhymes. As Jane Reichold writes in Writing and Enjoying Haiku, end rhymes close the haiku down usually, and most haiku want to leave on an open note. But internal and near rhymes, if they're done subtly, add to the smooth sound of a haiku. As Jim Cation says in his article, The Use of Language in Haiku, internal and off rhyme is a bit easier to accommodate as opposed to end rhyme, it being less powerful and final. And a good rule of thumb is to allow rhyme or off rhyme to stand in a poem if it comes to the poem unbidden and does not overpower the other elements in the poem. That sounds good to me. So uh, I think end rhyme is usually too heavy handed for haiku, but it can work if one of the pair is singular and one is plural. And also it can be used if the lines have different meters. Internal rhymes can unify ideas within a poem. It also can appear in different parts of compound words successfully. So you could use like twilight and lightning. That light is in both of them, but in very different ways. I think near rhyme is most effective as a rhyming technique in a haiku. Near rhyme is also referred to as off, slant, imperfect, or approximate rhyme. And they can be less intrusive and very effective. So let's take a look at one example of successful end rhyme, internal rhyme, and near rhyme. Bronze bell, a wooden bucket sways above the dark well. Now this one has a true end rhyme in lines one and three, but it doesn't feel sing-songy or heavy-handed. And I think it's because of the different meter in those lines. I think the rhyme also helps to accentuate the peals of the bell. That poem was by Ross Figgins. Rumble of thunder, the boy is still looking for the ball in the tall grass. Lee Gerga. In this poem, we have the internal rhyme of ball and tall. And I think it works because they're in different positions in those different lines. Last year's hostas, our losses turned to lace. Peter Newton. Here we have the near rhyme of hostas on the first line and losses on the second line. And I think they help to tie the poem together. This poem also has some alliteration, the L sounds, and that's gonna be our, the next device that we examine. So alliteration obviously is the repetition at close interval of initial consonant sounds. And as noted above, alliteration should also be used sparingly. It really works more effectively, I think, when there are words in between the words with the alliterative sounds. I was talking with haikuist Chuck Brinkley about sounds in haiku, and he recommended that I take a look at Lawrence Perrine and Thomas R. Arp's book, Sound and Sense, An Introduction to Poetry. I found something really interesting in there. They state that in addition to onomatopoeic words, there is another group of words that they call phonetic intensives, whose sound by a process as yet obscure to some degree connects to their meaning. So here uh, are some examples. The initial GL sound in, word, uh, in words signifies light, like glare, gleam, and glint. Initial SL sounds, as in slick, slime, and slosh, sometimes signify things that are smooth and wet. 
long O or OO sounds give you a melancholy or a sorrowful mood, as in moan, mourn, and gloom. The medial or middle ATT sound gives you movement, spatter, clatter, rattle. The final CK or hard C sound gives you a sudden cessation of movement, crack, peck, flick. It's intriguing to think that the sounds of the words have meaning and not just the whole words. Here are two examples of how alliteration can work in haiku. New moon, the milking stool missing. Jonathan Humphrey. Sometimes you want specific sounds repeated in a poem for a de very deliberate reason. I'm guessing that the repetition of the M sounds in this poem was meant to mimic the sound of a cow, especially the moo in moon. Here's another one. Maple buds waiting to leaf out where we left off. Michelle Root Bernstein. The L sounds in all three of these lines help to unify this poem. And the alliteration of waiting and where and left and leaf are not in back-to-back -back words. There are words in between that prevent the poem from being too heavy-handed. So all of those sounds, I think, really unify this poem. We're gonna talk about consonants next. Consonants is the repetition of consonant sounds in the medial or end positions of words. Lee Gerga asserts that consonants is less dominating than alliteration. It's definitely more subtle. Here's an example of consonants. First ice, an Oriole's nest loosening by Hannah Mahoney. The end consonant sounds of first and nest connects to the S sounds in ice, orioles, and loosening to help unify this poem. And the S sounds, I think, also further enhance the iciness of the scene. Let's talk about assonance next. Assonance is the repetition at close interval of vowel sounds rather than consonant sounds in the initial or internal positions. Ness also calls this vowel rhyme, which I think is a nice way to think of it. Lee Gerger writes that assonance is usually less, the least obtrusive of the aural devices. And I think assonance is perhaps the most effective sound unifier in a haiku. Here's an example of assonance. Midnight, the indigo within, Michelle Root Bernstein. I invite you to count the short I sounds in this poem. I was surprised to find a total of five, but I didn't realize there were that many until I counted them. I really think they enhance the unifying loneliness of the poem. Plus, there's only one long I sound in the word night. And I think that contrast helps to set up the moving inward motion or mood of the poem. Let's look at onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia is a word that through its sound, as well as its sense, represents what it defines. That's a quote from Mary Oliver from her book, A Poetry Handbook. William Higginson in the Haiku Handbook claims that onomatopoeia dramatically unifies a poem. Let's take a look. Tropical night surf, each crash and hiss phosphoresces. This is a very euphonious poem with three examples of onomatopoeia. The onomatopoeia of crash and hiss are nicely contrasting sounds. And the word phosphoresces 
sounds like the bubbles in the wave popping before it goes back to the sea. Now, as I've been thinking about euthymy and haiku, I've been noticing some other things at play. The first one I call letting the phrase conduct the fragment. Sometimes I write one part of a haiku, usually the phrase, the longer part, and then I let its sounds in an almost instinctual way lead me to associative sounds for the fragment. I go about this process by kind of repeating the phrase in my head, listening to its sounds, shuffling the sounds around, and hearing what emerges. Here's an example. Waxing moon, fiddler crabs mob the mudflats. Now, I was looking for the perfect verb to describe what I was seeing, and I was considering crawl and a few other ones. But then I just kept reading the words in the poem over to myself. And somehow the B sound in crab and the M sound in mud, I think led me to think of the word mob. Here's another one of mine. Sunbeams, a seam of cinnamon in my morning roll. While writing this one, I first came up with the phrase, a seam of cinnamon in my morning roll. And then I just kind of sat there in the sun with my tea, repeating the phrase in my head until the word beam came tumbling out, probably because it rhymed with seam. Here's my second consideration. I call it moonlighting. We all know that a word in a haiku can do more than one job. Perhaps helping to depict the haiku moment is the word's day job. But that same word, though, can moonlight. It can pick up some other jobs. It can also create some added euphony and or emotional resonance. Often there's one important word in a haiku that I think is doing the most work, the moonlighting. And I love to examine that word's ability to do multiple jobs. Let's look at two examples of this phenomenon. A jay stuffs more seeds into its esophagus last days of summer. In my first draft, I used the word crop, which I thought was the accurate word to use. But I didn't really like the sound of it. So I did some research online and found that it's actually not the crop that the jay is using as a storage container. It's actually part of its esophagus. And the word esophagus was the accurate word, but it also gave me two more S sounds and another F sound to create more unity, to tie it in with stuffs and all of the other S's. I also imagined that the extra S's were being stored in the word esophagus. Street Bazaar, the wind lifts a tune from a terracotta pot. Alan S. Bridges. I don't know the, the history of how Alan constructed this poem, but he could have used many different modifiers or descriptors for the word pop. The word terracotta sounds like a tune that the wind might make blowing into or over a pot. So that word served a dual purpose in the poem. It's accurate and it also creates some sound. The next element I want to talk about is choosing the right verb. The haiku has been called the poem of the noun. Of all the parts of speech in a haiku, nouns do seem to the ones to, that are most closely tied into the haiku moment. However, I think verbs are very important in haiku as well. The late great haiku poet Vince Trippi was an advocate of creating movement or action in haiku. And verbs are obviously the easiest and best way to do that. Verbs also sometimes give us more wiggle room than nouns. And they often have more synonyms than nouns as well. Here's an example of one of mine. A bee circles a beer glass rim, river swallows. 
I chose the verb circles because it accurately describes the actions of the bee. But it also gave me S and R sounds that I thought helped to unify the poem with alliteration and assonance. In addition, I like the fact that the word swallows, used as a noun in this haiku, also alludes to a verb that was helpful in the poem as well. Nouns like that are pure gold in a haiku, aren't they? Here's another example of choosing the right verb. Full moon, the sound of apples dropping to the ground. Carolyn Talmadge. Carolyn could have used falling or plunging for her verb, but the word dropping is perfect because it gives us the sound of that apple hitting the ground. The next element I wanna talk about, I call leaping for meaning. Sometimes we link or shift as we are reading a haiku to words that aren't even there. I've noticed that occasionally I leap from one word to a, in a haiku to another as I make associations. This can happen, I think, consciously or unconsciously. Here's an example. Pond willows hanging their own hammock in the park. Now, I workshopped this poem with my haiku friend, Mary Stevens. And when Mary gave me feedback about the poem, she told me she was picturing a pillow on the hammock, but there's no pillow in the poem. We realized that her association might have occurred because of an unconscious leap from the P at the beginning of pond to the illos at the end of willows, P plus illos equals pillows. This leaping can be assisted by a word already existing in the poem. Summer dusk, a duck's wake turns back the waves. Madeline Caritas Longman. If you take the D, U, and S in ducks, and the ending K in wake, it equals dusk. So the second line gives us a new way to create dusk and kind of reiterates that first line. Pretty magical. Sometimes I deliberately create a situation where another word could come to the reader's mind. Here's an example of that. Creek trickle. A chickadee lands in my hand. I use the word trickle in the first line in hopes that the word tickle might get conjured up, like the bird tickling my palm as it feeds. The last consideration that I want to mention, I call listening to the shapes. Sometimes the letters in the words that we've chosen for sound reasons can also yield something visual that adds to the poem's meaning. Turn after turn, the perpetual surf. I originally chose these multiple words with Rs because I wanted the repetition of the letters to mimic the repetition of the waves. And I thought the R's might also mimic the sounds of the waves. But thirdly, I also thought that the shapes of the letter R's is similar to the shapes of the waves. So I think there were three things going on with this one. Idling at an intersection, an island of cosmos. For this one, the assonance of the multiple long I sounds helped create unity, I think, in this poem. In addition, the letter I looks somewhat like a cosmos flower, which have long stems with the flower at the top. I want to end with one more quote from Pamela Miller Ness. We need to write with our ears as well as our eyes and minds. 
Thank you very much for listening to me today. And I look forward to reading your euphonious haiku in the future. That's it, I think. Um, thank you so much, Brad, for coming along and, and, and giving us this, this talk. It's certainly inspired me to have another go at, at certain things, particularly the leaping for meaning. I really must have a go at that. Um, and of course, if you want to read more of Brad's work, you can go to the show notes and you'll find out how to get in touch with him about his two books. Thank you very much, Brad. Thank you, Patricia. It was a pleasure, as always, talking with you. And I love sharing some ideas about sound. And uh, I'd love to see people's efforts in the future.